formal handover as a jury and it's the moment where you start to release to the public, I suppose, the, the, the work that you're really proud of and also some of the, the kickstart conversation piece that you've, um, that you've been talking about for the last four days. So it's a moment to really just um, take some time. We're hoping that it's quite casual how this might roll and, um, and there'll be the opportunity for the Premier to um, answer any questions. So I would like to formally welcome the Premier to our handover. Lovely to have you here as part of this process. We've been really excited to, to welcome you today. And there are a number of other guests that have joined us to see the handover to, from, from the citizens jury. Um, so we've got jurors lined up and ready to start um, taking us through. Adam, can you put, have you still got the document to pop up on the screen? Okay, got a little mechanical problem. But we might start, Caroline, are you ready to start by just giving a sense of the conversation that we've had around the, the principles for decision making, the call to action to the community and um, yeah, so I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Caroline. So one of the common feelings amongst the jury was with such a complex issue, we wanted people to consider it in a really thoughtful and, and structured way. So we came up with some principles for decision making that we wanted everyone to keep in mind. Yeah, can you? Sorry, I just need my cheat sheet. So, the principles that we felt were most important and needed to be in people's minds when they were discussing South Australia's involvement in the nuclear fuel cycle were legitimacy, a legitimate decision must include all people, inclusivity, there must be continual community consultation, transparency, all sources of information must be freely available. Accountability. Decision makers are accountable to the community. Consider the future. Further considerations and more debate of other options. We must also consider future generations of South Australians through all stages. Distribution. Potential economic benefits must be shared and accessible to everyone. Ethical. All decisions should be ethically and morally sound. What's good, what's right, what matters. So we wanted people to keep these principles in mind when they're thinking about our involvement in the nuclear fuel cycle. And the main thing is we really want everyone to be involved. We all feel really passionately about this and we want the wider community to as well. We wanted to put out a call to action to our fellow South Australians we, the Citizens' Jury, call on you, our fellow South Australians, to join us and be part of the process in shaping our state's future. This is a unique opportunity to be involved in the decision-making process in shaping the future for South Australia. Any future decision about the nuclear industry in our state will have long-term long commitment and consequences. The decision will affect not just us, but future generations. We encourage you to get involved and participate with an open and inquiring mind. Your voice will shape the future of our state and the decision, I'm sorry, and our descendants. Have your SA nuclear. That's a bit cheesy. But everyone's choice, everyone matters. Thank you. 
So, not sure how you want to go through this, Premier. We might take you start taking you through a bit more content, um, and um, as we go through, feel free to ask questions. So, the next chunk that we worked on as a jury was the section around safety, which was a really, really important part of our deliberations over the last four days. And I can't remember who's talking. Oh, Alicia, you're talking to safety, are you? No? Who's Darryl. talking to safety? Daryl, there you are. Okay. Sorry. Yes, we uh, looked uh, considerably at um, the safety issue and uh, based on, on information that was provided to us from the various speakers that we had, um, people who from the Royal Commission who had actually attended a lot of the facilities around the world, um, people who have, uh, like for example, the head of the geology in South Australia, um, and as we were presenting basically a um, pricey of the report, we had to sort of put in it the, the, the main things that they said, and much of which was based on the process being a fairly safe one. Um, there was, of course, within the group uh, some, um, I suppose, arguments for and against that, but in general, when we are simply reporting on the report, the report did suggest there was uh, considerable safety involved in having such a process developed here in South Australia. Um, which of course led into of course things like the health situation, so if we could just scan up please the, the, um, the thing there. Um, obviously the effect of uh, long-term exposure to um, radiation is a concern, but when we look at um, levels of radiation that people um, are exposed to on a day-by-day -day basis, much of the information that was provided um, would suggest that the uh, effect of possible leakage of radiation with the, such a facility would fall well within the realms of what a person is exposed to on a daily basis with respect to even flying in a plane or whatever the case may be. Um, <coughs> From the geological point of view, it was suggested that there are potentially um, a number of good sites around the state which would have the appropriate um, safety issues involved, I suppose, is of storing the waste without the likely possibility of um, hydrological problems and also seismic problems. However, obviously, there would have to be um, considerable more um, considerably more um, investigation into the, what sites would be the most uh, appropriate for that to be uh, to that to go ahead. Um, <clears throat> the thing that I think needs to be certainly spread to the local community is the fact that we are considering a site some 500 metres underground, which in itself creates certain safe uh, safeguards, and yet there are also um, areas where. The, the initial um, site will actually, sorry, the initial uh, uh, information, uh, capsules, etc., and the radioactive waste that comes in will be above ground for some period of time, maybe 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, again, the, the particular ways that particular um, waste will be stored, uh, again, according to the report, does suggest that there's some considerably safe aspects with respect to the to the capsules that are, uh, the, the waste will be stored in and where those capsules themselves will be stored in an above ground facility initially. Um, we obviously do not have a facility operating fully around other parts of the world for us to base a lot of our information on, but certainly Finland in particular, France and Sweden have, uh, are in the process of developing such, uh, such um, uh, facilities which uh, do does give us, I think, some hope in the future for providing a fairly safe um, facility. I think that's all. Is there anything else on the... Transport? Uh, sorry? Is there anything about transport? Oh, transport, yes. Uh, the transport aspects, uh, there is a, a lovely little uh, cartoon that we may well include on the sandwich. It indicates the um, potential... Well, so the level of safety involved with, first of all, shipping the particular material from a uh, country to, say, somewhere here in South Australia. Um, and then, of course, the transport of that material from uh, that above-ground storage facility after, say, 10, 20, 30 years 
to the actual below ground facility. Again, there is uh, a suggestion that the that particular procedures are considerably safe based on what they the material will be stored in, um, uh, and those particular um, things that have that uh, the particular. Um, storage facilities for that waste at, the, at that particular time has been subjected to considerable uh, stress from a point of view of firing rockets at it, dropping it from great heights, etc. Uh, does suggest that um, they do provide a fairly safe um, uh, place for that particular material to be stored in that particular time. Um, and I think that's probably pretty close to what had there. I mean, there have been some accidents around the world um, with respect to some of the storage but uh, from what we have gleaned from the report that the, there's, as it says there, there's no breach of, of the packages or release of harmful radiation as a result of that. Um, we do have, obviously have to separate this from the disasters of uh, uh, Fukushima and Chernobyl and even Maralinga from that point of view because we're not talking about uh, uh, nuclear explosions, we are talking about simply the um, safe uh, storage of this particular material. Okay. Great. Can, I, can I just yeah, ask? Sure. Can I just ask a question about the uh, the earlier um, page? Uh, there was a reference to uh, uh, flora and fauna. Um, some uh, in yeah. So there is some uncertainty around the impacts on flora and fauna which warrant further study, as is done in Finland. Could you just explain that a, a little bit? To more? be honest, I, I'm not fully aware of what that Finland study is. I mean, from a personal point of view, um, when we are looking at something 500 metres below the ground, um, I would think there would be certainly minimal impact in that regard. Um, again, maybe the above ground storage might be a slightly different situation with respect to some of the you know, smaller fauna, et cetera, that are around. So yeah, I, was, I can yeah. give you a um, specific response as well in relation to one of the witnesses provided us the the woman that works for Goldings is it Golding Goldings Lisa Van Golder Camp. Golder Golder um, yeah so one of the expert witnesses she um, told us that in Finland, uh, when she went over and did a study, the tour with the Royal Commission, uh, the, in Finland they, they've started 20 years ago, they started a study of the leaf structure. So then they can compare the reaction of the flora and fauna uh, over, you know, a long, in a longitudinal sense as yes. well. And that was a real eye-opener. A lot of people hadn't thought about what the long-term uh, impacts of radiation would be on flora and fauna in the region because the small and then the another one of the experts Dr. Lowe said that um, uh, for us humans that level of radiation may be safe but for smaller animals like little marsupial mice um, we don't know what the effects are on their gorgeous little bodies. Okay so that the idea is that that's um a further study that should accompany any next step. Yep. Particularly in relationship to a site that may be chosen, more so than in general? Now, in relation to um, the sites, the next point there about um, geological and seismic st stability, um, was, there a, was there a view that that, um, that that work needed to occur before people would be comfortable taking a next step? I think probably that's the case. I mean, the interesting thing is um, there are three possible um, geological aspects that could be considered. First of all, there's obviously a hard rock situation. Um, there's also a clay situation and even a salt situation that the um, head of the geological uh, here in South Australia uh, group said. Um, and probably, uh, I, I dare say, research would have to be carried out as to which one of those was probably better than the other. So. Sorry, just to add to that. Um, I, I can't remember his name, but the chief geologist was saying that um, we've got fairly incomplete data about um, the geology of South Australia, and most of the data that's been gathered has been in relation to 
mining or searching for water sources, which is um, kind of the, the opposite of the sorts of data yeah. that we're looking for for this kind of facility. Just looking for the absence of mineral it, resources. Exactly. So we'd, we'd, we wouldn't want to site something like this near an aquifer or you know, in the middle of a gold deposit or, or whatever. Um, so he did highlight that there's, um, while we do have world class um, uh, record keeping for our geological data, that there are still significant gaps in the, the, the quantity of data uh, across the state. Excellent. Great, thanks Daryl. Okay, um, so the next, the next section of the report was about consent and trust. So the jury, this was something that has, um, has been really complex for us to, or for them to unpack, and, um, but really some really fundamental um, concepts. So I'll hand over to Marcel, who's right next to me. Thank you. Again, thank you, Premier, for us taking part in this process. Um, it was mentioned earlier in the principles that consent and engagement was paramount in any further progress of the nuclear fuel cycle. So while this section may not be as long verbally or in words, it is um, knitted in and interwoven throughout the whole mm. document. So what we're saying is that there needs to be both broad social informed consent and specific community consent, notably if for those sites that may be or site that may host such a facility. So that has to be there. And also that the social consent is not given once, but it is ongoing for the, for the life of that activity. So we've got some references. And that we are also calling as a call to arms in, under the principles is that all South Australians' opinions are valued. So you have to be informed or educated so that you can make such a decision. And also there's the opportunity to gain expert witnesses or view facilities in order to gain that information or education. We also believe in the importance of the Aboriginal and local community engagement and consent. We did for talk a bit, uh, quite a bit strongly on the word engagement as versus consultation. So engagement was a more appropriate word, so we're quite strong on that. Uh, we're also aware for the community um, that the laws need to be changed for any new nuclear activity to be developed in South Australia, and we've referenced that. We've also noted that there is history of lack of community consent, and I guess engagement invariably leads to failure. So we also had some questions to put to the rest of the community, how the community's consent is measured and made, and how they as individuals and as a society can be involved. And we also recommend that they look at the recommendations in Chapter 10, look at some of the report summary and some of the basic information on radiation risks and the disposal of nuclear waste. So that was about it. it we, the area isn't large in words, but it's strongly interwoven that the community has to be informed, educated, and drive this process along with the government. Because if that doesn't happen, it won't occur at whatever level that goes. So do you want to take us through into straight into trust? Okay. Marcel, while well, you're going. All right. Um, we highlighted again that you know there was there was a need, as as the title says, this is vital for trust, accountability, and transparency, and that. We as a state and as citizens, we've got a choice as to whether or not we want to further engage. So that's referenced in the report. And we need to um, promote trust and transparency it needs to be built in the design of any regulatory system moving forward if we do. And, it's the, and again, as part of the principles, the decision affects both future generations here in South Australia and the options for other nations for the management of their high level used fuel waste. And that we need to consider, as mentioned, under the principles again, moral and ethical responsibilities are central to the ownership and the integrity of our decision. You know, do we think these actions are good? Do we think they are the right ones? And that was again referenced in the principles. We also noted in the report the international principle of radioactive waste management is that the society that generates it is responsible for it. 
but there is also those that are unable to manage their own waste that they can contract that radioactive waste management process to another country. And again, a question, just to start those conversations. So we need to, um, the challenge is to build and maintain, maintain trust by avoiding repeating mistakes from the past in, through the lack of engagement and communications, such as Maralinga. So we report that the legislation in a specific item of legislation needs to be removed in order to encourage or finance construction or operation of a nuclear waste storage facility. And that further investigation cannot proceed without changing this legislation. So I think that is about it. I know there's a bit more. Uh, we also went... Oh, not on the economics part, that's another section. Mm. But we also recommend that the removal of state, a, state level and or federal level exist, uh, legislation, which currently um, prohibits uh, the licensing of uranium processing activities, needs to change to enable the commercial development of such items such as nuclear fuel leasing and uh, nuclear power generation. So we need to, as a community, need to ensure that any measures put in place are what we want and that we have the opportunity as the public to review any proposed changes to legislation similar to this process. So strong, active community engagement. Great. Good job. Well done. Okay, the last big section of the report was around the economics and the benefits and risks for the state. So Patrick's going to take us through that. Thank you. Uh, so we looked at the economics of specifically the establishing a used nuclear fuel and uh, an intermediate level waste storage and disposal facility. And um, so we looked through the Royal Commission report and also heard from various uh, economic experts. And basically the general gist of it is we found that um, the Royal Commission found that it's a, it's a very viable option and that there's a highly probable chance of um, good profits. Um, however, the experts had mixed reviews. Some were saying that it wasn't as viable and some saying that there's too many um, assumptions and variables that still need to be um, researched into. Uh, so basically, we all thought that this area requires more research and in particular, there's legislation which restricts us from um, doing further research and talking with other countries to find out exactly how much of what and for how much we can actually get. Um, there was also other factors such as uncertainty for the future because um, we recognise that this is a long-term project and we don't know um, how many years before we start or if we start doing something like this. And that obviously poses challenges such as changes in technology or um, alternate solutions popping up. Um, so. Basically, we were left with more questions at the very end, um, and even though the Royal Commission report said that you know, it's definitely highly profitable, there are definitely more questions that need to be asked, and definitely further um, research that needs to be done into this, into this area. So, d do I understand you to say that the, um, the way you, that you've tried to resolve the difference in the experts uh, is to try and um, reduce this uh, uncertainty about the assumptions? that the experts have actually based their expert opinion on. And the key one is um, what essentially another country would be prepared to pay for this and that that would involve us having to have a more detailed discussion about that and actually get that commitment so that we could evaluate the real benefit, not the assumed benefit, uh, if you like. That's correct. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. At the moment, the legislation on one view of it, it's not entirely clear prevents us from spending money to do that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so okay. Some, of the, some, of the, sorry, some of the questions yeah. we were left with um, was then also what are we going to do with the, um, if we were to set up this um, waste facility, uh, what would we do with the funds that were generated from it? Um, we also talked about um, would this sort of uh, facility affect the reputation of the area? both in tourism and, and trade. Um, we also looked at uh, what kind of reliance there was on countries to pre-commit, because obviously this is about upfront payments from countries to, to start building a facility mm. like this. Um, 
but yeah, those are some of the questions, and also such as um, workforce, workforce opportunities, skills, and training. So all these questions need still answering. So yeah, it's definitely um, there's a lot of questions still to answer. So is it fair to say that a much clearer idea of uh, the benefits was you think would be necessary as we go into this next phase to assess people to have a look at it? Yes, I think just basically just the assumptions that were in the uh, Royal Commission just need to be yeah. um, just some of them made definite so that we know exactly what figures we're working with and, and what time frames we're working with more precisely and, and then that would give us a better figure of what sort of profits we're looking at. Was there also a discussion about the uh, costs um, that might the state might have to commit to or the Commonwealth for that matter uh, in the lead up to because I think it's pretty clear and, every, and nobody would build one of these things unless you had a pre-commitment. So assuming that you didn't start building it uh, until you had a pre-commitment. So was there a discussion about how much South Australia would have to spend to get to the point where we'd sign a deal with someone? Yeah, there was. Um, these were figures somewhere in between um, 300 and $600 million. Um, there were figures that were lower than that. Other figures, other economists were not sure exactly. Um, so this is something which... Um, obviously has to be considered whether these sort of funds are, uh, what sort of these figures are used. Um, but yeah, that's, that's another question again, how much, how much okay. it costs so, to get so to that point. So having some clarity about the, uh, to up, getting up to the point where you would potentially enter into a contract with a country, how much would South Australia have to spend? That's correct. Okay. okay. Okay, I just wondered before we hand over to the Premier whether there were any other jurors that wanted to make any other comments about the report or about your work. Oh, what have we missed? Oh, we missed the intro. Yeah. <laughs> Who's, are you taking us through that? No. Alicia. Sorry, Alicia. I knew you were doing something. We'll just start from the end. End with the start. Okay, so we just went through, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So we started with um, letting the rest of South Australia know what our purpose here, um, what the citizens jury is and what we're doing here, how we were um, chosen, how it was a random selection. And um, we have some figures there on the table that show um, the distribution of, you know, like it was a, um, all the people here represent the mm. South Australian community. Yep. Um, we then went into, we then went into the nuclear fuel cycle and just explaining an kind of like an overall, what is the nuclear fuel cycle? Um, Yep, there we go. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the four main um, stages. So there's the mining and the milling, the enrichment and fuel fabrication, electricity generation, and then the um, used fuel management and storage. Uh, we wanted to make quite clear that the um, Royal Commission report recommended that the main um, key issue that South Australia need, should look to is the storage mm. of fuel, um, used fuel, and um, that that is the main focus of the, our citizens' jury. That was the main focus of the four days um, that we were here. So the Royal Commission report doesn't um, recommend that we produce nuclear energy or anything like that. We are just talking about the um, storage of waste. And I think that's it. Yeah, so then we just talked about the, um, the decision making process, mm. the different stages. Um, it's important for South Australian community to know. Um, that it, there are many, what we're doing here isn't saying yes or no, what we're doing mm. is starting the conversation and um, put
putting forth the discussion that needs to be made. Great, good job. Thanks, Alicia. Excellent. So, um, with that, I just will open up just if there are any jurors that have any final comments and then hand over to the Premier for his reflections. Assessment of our work. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for being brave enough to participate in a process which is very unique and involves the community in a really special and engaging way. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you uh, for that presentation. Um, before I start, I might, um, I might just ask a few more questions about mm. the report because um, I, I just, is there, is there any, uh, are there any sort of things, facts or graphs or uh, pictures that leapt out of you? It was a bit of an aha moment where you sort of thought, oh, that really helped my understanding of this. The reason I, want, the reason I ask that question is that um, now after four days, you're actually much more informed than you were at the start. But the next phase is actually going out to the community and they're going to start where you started. Uh, so we've, uh, what I want to try and get you to do is to go back and think about what you were like on day one and what was the thing that was the, you know, the thing that jumped into your mind as being helpful because that's something we want to capture through this. You are correct and I believe in our introduction piece uh, and, and it will come through in the formatting and the styling of the document. We actually took the four stages pictures from the summary of the um, Royal Commission report and then we're building a table which is colour code coordinated back to each of those stages and then each of the questions that we had will be documented or should I say highlighted in each of those boxes. So it makes it very clear for the individual that this is stage one is green, stage two is etc cetera, etc. Cetera, because we felt that a picture says a thousand words. Yeah. Right. One more, Daryl. You don't need Personally I, I think one of the things that the general public would like to see would be one, a representation of what a storage facility would look like, showing the fact that we are 500 metres below the surface of the earth. Secondly, what the, um, new, the spent fuel rods are actually stored in, the, the capsules, their makeup, to sort of present a more realistic picture of the safety aspects of, of the, uh, the process. Emily, have you got another one? Yeah. You go first, Marcel. Oh, in other parts, there was other graphs from um, the report in relation to transport and the odds of accidents to date in relation to the transport of these sealed canisters. So that was a graph that was to go in. There was also another table or, or graph in relation to the stages of radioactivity and as it reduces down. So that's to be included as well. It's not in this document, but we've referenced that there are to be, you know, as, as Caroline said, Caroline? Yeah, pictures say a thousand words. Uh, my one that I would, I would think would be important to include, um, there's a lot of misconception about the danger here and we talked a lot um, and thoroughly about putting risks in context, uh, so I'd like to include at the table um, that shows the relative radiotoxicity versus what we're exposed to every day. Those dangerous bananas. And What's the that? linked chocolates, yeah. the linked chocolates that we enjoy. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Marcel. We didn't have any information about the route the transport might take through the state. And mm. I think that would be very important to the people living in the communities mm. where such transport was passing. Mm. Excellent, thank you. And, sorry, another one too, just maybe a diagram too of the proposed economic benefits of what we think mm. it might be comparative to um, the money that the state already draws in from everything else. Yeah. So, so you, um, comparing the, the oh, I see, so giving people a relative picture on the relative size of this compared with 
what our existing revenue base is, because yeah. most people wouldn't know how much money comes into the state through revenue. Yeah, I see. Okay, well, if there were no other uh, contributions there, can the first thing I want to say is thank you. I mean, I, it's an extraordinary thing to give up two weekends of your life. Um, and I understand it, uh, it also became quite uh, demanding, uh, especially as you were trying to grapple with turning this into writing. And uh, so I thank you so much for all the energy, the brain power, uh, the physical energy, the emotional energy that you put into this exercise. Um, I, um, I really think this is important. I think um, we've just had an election where uh, nobody knows who's well. I think they've worked it out today. But uh, uh, I think in a real sense, this, um, if this election spoke to anything, it's, it's a bit of a, uh, doubts about our democracy. Uh, and so what we're trying to do, I think, is to reform our democracy. And, and uh, so this is a big experiment, and you're part of it. Uh, and I think from what I've seen today, um, it's a fantastic start. We're taking a big complicated issue that is very important uh, and what you have seem to have done is uh, you've come to a set of conclusions about the way forward using two really important uh, tools. One is you've put yourself in the shoes of, of everyone else rather than just You've stepped outside yourself, which I think that's being a citizen rather than just being a, an individual with your own perspectives, which I think is magnificent. And the second thing is you've done it constructively and there's been no fistfights, I understand, which is <laughs> tremendous, uh, and, and conducted in a way which is quite in contrast to the general political discourse we see, which is a bit of a punch and duty act. So those, all of those things, I think, just bode really well for the future. So um, thank you so much for the work that you've done. Um, I suppose uh, I'll, I'll play back what I've heard a bit here, and that is that uh, it, it seems that there, it's important um, for people to take the next step uh, for them to have the, uh, that the risks, the safety risks, um, explained to them in, in detail so they can make an assessment of that important question. It's important that they uh, have a much clearer and settled idea of the benefits and the potential costs for South Australia so they can make an evaluation of that. Uh, and it appears that you seem to be saying that you want to stay, you want citizens somehow to stay involved in this process at every step of the way. It seems what you've designed is a series of steps which are sort of um, go, no go, and then proceed with caution, go, no go, proceed with caution. And, and at any stage, the community can retrieve the decision-making process. Uh, so that sounds like a, an intelligent way of going forward. And one thing I did hear when a conversation before I, before I sat down was that somebody said that uh, uh, you wanted to continue to be part of the conversation. You don't want to be excluded from the conversation just when it goes over to the politicians to make a decision, you don't want that to be the end of it. You want to be able to have, um, it's conditional. You're conditionally handing the decision over to the politicians, not absolutely mm -hmm. handing the decision over. So you have to keep checking in, which I think is uh, a powerful observation. So um, I, I suppose from, from my perspective, uh, what you've done is the very thing that we ask you to do, and that is produce a guide to allow the rest of the citizens to look at this report. Uh, one big thing it seems you've done is you've taken sort of, of the four areas to look at, you've taken three of them off the table, which will make the report easier to read because you're now just talking about waste, which the rest are sort of for another day and, and are not really part of the present consideration uh, uh, for the community. So that's a good thing. That'll reduce the size of people's consideration by about 75%, which is a good thing. Um, and um, there seems like there's some further investigations that we need to undertake and that we might have to change the legislation to give ourselves permission to do that. So that's the next bit of work that we will involve ourselves in. We'll, obviously, this will now be published. Um, I'll, make this, I'll present this to the parliament and we'll use this to guide uh, the next steps that we take in particular going out to the community between now and uh, 
uh, the end of the year when um, I hope as many of you as possible will be able to participate in the 350 person <laughs> citizens jury which will be quite a thing to behold so uh, I think uh, you've given us a wonderful start so thank you so much uh, for participating in this big experiment in reforming our democracy and if we're able to be successful I think South Australia will be leading the nation in some respects leading the world in this uh, in this way of uh, resolving difficult questions. So thank you so much. Okay, that wraps up our time together and um, would like to recognise the jury and thank the jury for all of their very hard work. Thank you again, Premier, for coming along this afternoon and, um, and dipping into to what we've done and I wish everyone a safe travels home. I think... Uh But can I, uh, on behalf of uh, the jury and the government, thank uh, you, Emily, oh, and the, your team uh, for the wonderful work you've done. Uh, there's, there's lots of people here that have, that have really played an important role in making this a success, not the least the technical elements, as well as um, uh, the people that are just providing uh, food and provisions and uh, making sure this all goes smoothly. And, New Democracy, um, Ian, thank you so much for the wonderful work that you do. There's just so much uh, great work. And also the uh, advisory panel who have been here to uh, supervise the work. Thank you so much for giving up your weekends as well. Thank you. <laughs>